Lisa Raitt had a successful political career for more than a decade, some of that time as a cabinet minister and deputy leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. But through a series of social media posts in her post-political life, she has become the voice for a generation of caregivers in this country. Back in 2016, Lisa's husband, Bruce Wood, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease at the age of 56. And since then, too much of her life has been pure hell. Lisa Ray joins us now from Moffat, Ontario, just northwest of Milton, with more on her odyssey as a caregiver. Lisa, it's really good to see you again. Thanks for doing this tonight. I appreciate the invitation, Steve. It's an important topic. Indeed it is. I want to start by showing you a picture that I know you have seen before. Look at that. Look at that gorgeous gang. There you are with your two sons yeah. and yeah. with the guy you fell in love with. And I want to start by having yeah. you tell us about that guy that you fell in love with in that picture. Uh -huh. Steve, it's hard to look at those pictures, man. I um, because I I've done a really good job of compartmentalizing this so that I only see Bruce for what he is now. I don't think about uh, what he was like before, and I certainly don't think about what it is that we've lost. And th that's the only way that a lot of caregivers can get through the day is just focusing on the very much present. But to let you know. So he's wearing his Buffalo Bills jacket, and he would have been absolutely devastated by the game that happened on, on Sunday <laughs> evening. Uh, I, yes. I screamed for him, I will say, and I did ask his nurse to put it on the on the general television at Baycrest. I'll find out tonight whether or not they actually he actually watched it. But uh, Bruce was a very powerful guy. He was CEO of CAA Southwestern. He was CEO of the Hamilton Port Authority. He absolutely uh, was a fantastic golfer. He had lots of great friends. And he was a guy's guy, for lack of a better word. You know, he loved football. He played hockey on the weekends. And as time went by, I noticed a bit of a change in personality, um, a significant one. He became a lot more irritable, a lot more cranky. And to be honest, by the time we got to 2014 and 15, I thought we weren't going to get married. We were going to break up because he was so difficult to deal with. And um, they noticed it at work. And at work, what they noticed is that he couldn't write reports anymore. And he didn't know when meetings were happening. When he traveled for business, he always had to have somebody with him. Um, I remember getting very angry at him in 2013 because he had his assistant go to a conference with him in Vancouver. And I was at the conference as well as the minister. And I was just so upset that he would bring her and I'm a little sad now because I realize he brought her because he just couldn't function. He couldn't make meetings and he was terrified. So that's that was his workaround on how to deal with it. Um, so, you know, it was a steady decline. We met in 2008 and um, became a couple in 2009. And between nine and, and 13 were the good years. And then from 13 on, uh, you could start to see the symptoms. And it really did take away from that wonderful, joyous personality and fun guy that I knew. What year did you get married, Lisa? 16. We got married after the diagnosis because, number one, it explained a whole lot of what was going on in our relationship. Uh, little things, you know, things that drive couples crazy. Like I would say, well, would you like to go to dinner tonight? And he would say, you make the decision. Or he would ignore me. Or he'd forget my birthday or get something, the wrong cake for my birthday. I hate Black Forest cake. And he used to buy me Black Forest cake three years in a row. And it became a little bit of a joke in my family. But... The reality is, is that it was, he knew there was something about that cake. He just forgot it was the fact that I detested it. Um, but he, um, you know, he and I, uh, we got married in 16. And the reason why was because I wanted him to have certainty. And I wanted him to know that I had his back and I was going to be there for him. And I was going to look after him. And we were more than just co-signers on a mortgage. We were life partners and we were, we were legal and blessed by, by uh, the church. So that was very important for me. I know you've been asked this before, and I know it's a tough question. Um, I mean, you knew that your life going forward was going to be nothing like the life that you had originally hoped for when you two got together as a couple, and you married him anyway. No second thoughts about that, eh? Not even, no, no, I mean, actually, so Bruce wanted to get married lots of times. And what I would always say to him is, I'm a cabinet minister, and I'm pretty busy. I can't organize a wedding. And I said, it's up to you to organize it. If you want to get married, you organize it. And he never did. And the reality is, Steve, he, 
he couldn't. He couldn't organize anything. He had lost executive functioning. So when I realized that in March, I sat down and I had dinner with a couple of girlfriends in Ottawa at, at High's because it was open at the time. And I said, I think I want to get married. And we put it together in 30 minutes. 30 minutes hmm. is how long it took for us to pick a date, pick where we were going to have it, how we we're going to handle the food and uh, who was going to be invited. And that was it. We just put it in action, all hands on deck. And I'm grateful for, for them for being there. Let's share some numbers that you know all too well, because you, of course, are representative of a lot of people who are going through the same kind of thing across this country right now. Sheldon, if you would, let's put up this graphic. More than half a million people in Canada have dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. At least 16,000, that's 2 to 8% of all cases, suffer from what's called young onset dementia. That's what Bruce has. What qualifies somebody for young onset? Well, when symptoms show up before the age of 65, some people are diagnosed even as young as their 30s uh, when they get young, young onset dementia. Now, let me follow up with that. And I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, again to put up a more recent picture of you and Bruce, since we've seen some of the pictures from back in the day. Uh, and Sheldon, at your convenience, dissolve to the next one as well. And Lisa, maybe you could tell us when these pictures were taken. Those were taken uh, Christmas of 2020. And um, he was in real bad shape at the time. He was in really bad shape. Um, you can tell that he wasn't shaving. He wouldn't let us shave him. He was just having a horrible time with being tormented by hallucinations and he didn't know who I was. He, uh, he'd ask me all the time who I was. He would tell me he wants to go home. I would say, this is your home. Um, all the wrong things to do, by the way. You're not supposed to tell them that this isn't their home. You're supposed to say, yes, I'll take you to your home and find a way to divert them. But he wasn't sleeping. He was roaming around the house at night. He, uh, I wasn't sleeping. It was terrible. Hmm. It was terrible. But in that moment where you saw me crying a little bit, was we were looking at my wedding ring and I said, do you know what this is? And he said, yeah, you're my wife. And it's the first time in a long time I heard him say that. And, and that's why I choked up in the moment. Hmm. You began to post on your Facebook page um, some accounts of the changes that you saw in your husband. Why did you decide to do that? You know, maybe it was a cry for help, Steve, and understanding. Um, so we're in the lockdown. It is the pandemic. It is the spring of 2020 rolling into the fall of 2020. It seems so long ago now, but it was it was <laughs> not very long ago in my world. Bruce started to decline rapidly, and his changes were behavioral in nature. And um, he just started uh, being very destructive and very obstructive and very threatening. He would threaten my kids. He threatened me. He put holes in the wall. He ripped doors off hinges. He he destroyed the side of a car with a uh, with a garden implement. It was a pair of large shears. Um, he was just out of his mind. Literally, he would have fights in Costco with his reflection in the big mirrors or in the big freezer doors. Um, when we were driving, he would think that his reflection in the side view mirror was somebody he wanted to fight. He would try to open the door. He would undo his seatbelt. Completely unmanageable during the day. And then at night, it was worse. He would get up at night and roam around. He would be all through the house. He would break stuff. He would try to get out of the doors. And then he wouldn't wear pants. And then he wouldn't get dressed. And then he wouldn't bathe. And it was just continuing. I started posting after he became physically aggressive with me. And the reason being is perhaps I was looking for somebody to call up and say, look, here is where you need to go and this is what you need to do because I wasn't, although I was talking to people within the health system, I really wasn't getting the help that I needed. I really, really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And he was so young and so big and so strong um, that any of the normal interventions that they would counsel you on just didn't work. And it put us at great peril. And I posted that. And uh, boy, I was really shocked how many other folks out there are in exactly the same situation. Well, I'm going to get to that in a second, but I want to I want to follow up on because you did something that was um, well 
super important in terms of being able to explain to people what you and what your household was actually like at that moment. Uh, you must have grabbed for your iPhone and taken some video of Bruce in a moment mm -hmm. that 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 would be just difficult to explain had you written it out. The video shows so much, and I want to just show us a short excerpt of some of that video that you took just to show people, give them a better sense about what your life was like. Okay, Sheldon, roll that if you would. Got the rack. That's too stupid. I don't have a character. I don't. I get this right here, right here, right here. Right here. Well, say, say something. What can I do? I don't know. Get up and go. Okay, I will. Right now. Okay. Jesus Christ. You had written that that kind of thing would happen in the middle of the night and you would have sleepless nights. I, I mean, I have to ask you, um, I mean, w were you in fear for your life at a moment like that? The reason why the video exists is because I grabbed the phone to dial 911 because I didn't know which way it was going to go. Uh, that was about five in the morning, and he had been up for most of the night. He was dressed. Actually, that's when he's vocalizing pretty good there. He doesn't have any vocal vocalizing right now. Um, he doesn't have many words, probably 30 words or so. So for me, it's kind of neat to see him. He's still there in that video. You know, he's still he's still Bruce. Uh, he's very different today. He's not as as alert as he is in that one. But the anger is there. And two things, Steve. One is you could hear him muttering, uh, I don't have a car. That was on a constant loop in his head that he wanted a car, he wanted to drive because driving was freedom for him and he wanted to get away. And that's why he ended up bashing in the side of my car because he didn't know how to drive it. It went from being a normal stick shift to being one of those turns where you dial the, the um, how you dial to get into gear. And as a result, he couldn't drive it anymore and he was very frustrated. And then he was gesturing to his stomach area. And for the longest time, you know, we worked with doctors to try to figure out what was bothering him, what was his ailment, why was he so upset? And we never discovered what his ailment was, except for the fact that we think it was just incontinence. And then he was so frustrated that he couldn't remember when he was going to the bathroom anymore. And he blamed that on me. So we blamed the lack of car on me. He blamed that on me. And that would become very irritable to him and, and he would react. Here is some of what you wrote on your Facebook post, which uh, we shall share with our viewers and listeners right now. Sheldon, if you would, the graphic, please. Bruce started having hallucinations and delusions in the fall 2019. In the beginning, it was him suddenly not recognizing who I was. On Christmas Day 2019, he went to our neighbors to tell them that there was a strange woman in his house and he wanted her to leave. He recognized them, but not me. These moments would happen at least twice a week. Sometimes it would pass quickly, and sometimes he forced me to leave the house. Next, he threatened my parents, and they had to leave the house. He told my son Billy he was going to kill him and chased him. I took the knives out of the house. Lisa, I wonder during the yeah. course of all of this, how often you have to keep reminding yourself, this isn't him, this is the disease, this isn't him, this is the disease. Did you do that? Oh, yeah, and I knew that. I knew that wasn't him. Um, but I was afraid of of him. Um, I still am a little bit, uh, you know, in case he he's still very strong. And and I still get worried that if he gets angry, he's going to strike out. And of course, when he's being treated by nurses and and that's one of the reasons why, Steve, he couldn't go into long term care. He was not accepted by anybody. So it was just that's why he was stuck uh, with me. That's why he was stuck in the house with me, because nobody would accept him in the state that he was in. It's just a it's just a reality. He's a danger. So I would remind myself of that all the time. I read every book possible on how to redirect, how to divert, what to do. I had house I had uh, care keepers come in to try to do the same. He threatened them um, and they were older women than I was and smaller in stature and they were scared. 
And it was, it was the disease. I know it was the disease, but the disease is embodied in a very strong athletic man. And that's why the disease becomes extremely dangerous. Yeah, we we should remind everybody he's he's like six two two forty or something like that, right? Yes, he is. So, exactly. and yeah. Now you you are a, I mean I know you you are a tall person. I'm tall, but yeah. um, well, I'm five ten, but we don't need to talk about my weight. <laughs> <laughs> let's just focus on the five ten. You're a very tall, striking <laughs> person. I agree. I agree. Um, Again, I, I, I feel odd asking these questions because I don't want to invade your privacy, but I do want to give people a sense about what you were dealing with here. Did did he ever strike you? Yeah. Yeah, he did. He punched me in the head. I uh, he punched my son, Billy, in the back, shoved him into a wall. He always picked on people smaller than him. Uh, my son, JC, is 6'4", so he's taller than Bruce, and he really didn't try to do anything to him at all. Christmas just running up to Christmas of 2020, where it was really bad, the month of December was horrific. He actually tried to kick our King Charles Cavalier dog, Ruby, and Ruby was his princess. I mean, he loved that dog. He loves me, but he loved that dog. And he tried to kick her and you know, he threw a punch at me and my son stopped it. It could have been a lot worse than it was. And you know, the knives comment, um, I did take a picture around that time where I found a butcher knife underneath my bed. Uh, we shared bed, and I was underneath the bed on his side. And I realized that he had weapons stashed all over the house and I didn't know about them. And it was, it was terrifying. So I had to go through, I actually gave my knives to my next door neighbor and uh, they were out of the house as soon as I could. My goodness. Okay, let's get back to your social media posts, because as you indicated earlier, you started to write some things on Facebook about your experiences, and before long, there are just, I mean, message after message after message after message from people who essentially said, I feel your pain. I, they're going through the same thing. At what point did you sort of realize that you were becoming a voice for a whole generation of caregivers across the country? I realized it when I started having people go to a group that I suggested called Hilarity for Charity to belong to, um, I guess, a group helpline, for lack of a better word. So in the United States, there's a group called Hilarity for Charity, started by Seth Rogen, great Canadian comedian, and his wife, Laura. And what they do is they fund social workers and therapists to host group meetings with spouses of, of early onset Alzheimer's as caregivers. And I've been meeting with them since June of 2020. My group has been together. Some have left and some have come in. But when I noticed that the social worker told me that she is seeing more and more Canadians come in because of the fact that I'm talking about hilarity for charity. And that's when I realized that this was having an impact and people really did want to reach out and get some help. What do we not know, but need to know about what life for caregivers is like? That it's, that it's 24 seven. Um, that it really does take a, a toll on you emotionally and physically. And a lot of the times when you're young, you're put, or youngish, you know, in your fifties, sixties, you, especially when it's a spouse, you are put in the position where you early retire, you take a part-time gig, you drop off in hours, you start not producing as well at work, and it has a real impact on, on you as an individual and on your career and on your trajectory of your career. And I think that's the piece that I'd like folks to understand from an economic point of view. Um, there's a lot of folks who are going to be MIA in the workplace who should be in the workplace as a result of care responsibilities they have, which cannot be outsourced. Even if you want to pay for it, they just can't get outsourced into, into a care society because we just don't have the tools. Uh, I, I know you're not going to complain about this, but I think it's probably worth putting on the record that, uh, you know, you, you wanted to run for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada and, and you know, you had a lot of support out there and, you know, you obviously couldn't do that well and make the commitment to doing that well yeah. uh, and have to take care of Bruce at the same time. How much do yeah. you 
rue the fact that, um, I mean, you had a great political career as it was, Lisa, but you might have been able to do more if not for this. How much do you think about that? I think about it only in this context that I would like caregivers to know that you think you can do it all, but you can't. You really can't. Mm -hmm. And that caregiving does take an impact. Look, when I was going through it, Steve, I thought I could do anything, I could travel. But in the meantime, here I am trying to figure out, uh, okay, who's gonna babysit Bruce while I go to do three weeks of French immersion in Quebec City? Every night I'm worried about him, I try to get him on the phone. I mean, those are real concerns. He wasn't even in really bad shape in 16, but I didn't want him to be left alone because the enormity of knowing that you have Alzheimer's, because at the time he knew he had Alzheimer's and it was fatal, and that was extremely difficult. That was just so sad. And he was so angry about having the disease that I wanted to be there for that. But for anyone to say that I can do it all, yeah, maybe you can, but you need to have 24 seven around the clock caregivers. And that my friends cost about $300,000 a year. And nobody has that after tax dollars. Well, that does raise the question of what kind of policy changes you think we need uh, for governments at all levels to implement in order to make the life of caregivers a little more civilized. I'm going to focus on the group that I know the best, which is folks who end up having spouses who have behavioral problems because they're the ones that can't tap into the normal community resources. Would my life have been better and easier if we didn't have COVID and Bruce could go to an adult daycare? Probably. I could probably balance it and then have some home care come in and then top it off with what I could afford in private care as well. I could have probably made it work, but he had behavioral symptoms. And as a result, uh, he needed to be hospitalized because uh, I just couldn't, couldn't handle it here. There are only 16 to 20 beds available in Toronto for that. Think about it, 16 to 20 beds for that. And it's always full and it always has a wait list. And then after they're treated and better like Bruce is now, there's no place to put them. So they end up staying in the hospital, taking up a bed that probably is really well needed. So for me, a big policy piece is understanding that Alzheimer's is a striation of many different ages and many different types. And don't assume that it's all the case where it's your 78-year-old grandmother who is very docile and, and is slipping away quietly and you worry about her wandering. It's not always that case. It's Sometimes it's a real serious matter and we have to be nimble and we have to step back from this, I guess, this assumption that the burden can be carried by people at home because it really can't. Hmm. Where is Bruce now? So Bruce is on um, a behavioral neurology unit at Baycrest Hospital in Toronto, 4 West. He is there not because he was on a wait list and finally made it in. He is there because I had to call 911 on January 1st, 2021. He was, when I I'm going to be graphic, Steve, because I think it's important. So the police had to come. They had to handcuff him and take him away to the Milton Hospital. I couldn't visit him for the first 24 hours uh, because of COVID. And then finally, he was so disruptive that they said, we'll bring her in, meaning me. And when I saw him, he was in a room with a locked door and a window. There was a security, security guard outside of his door. And inside, he was restrained by four points, two hands and two feet, and was in an adult diaper. And that's it. And I was horrified because the system didn't know how to deal with somebody that big with um, hallucinations and delusions. And, you know, physical restraint is difficult. Chemical restraint is equally difficult. Shooting them up with Haldol or, or some kind of strong sedative is also really difficult. Uh, but from there, he was, um, thank goodness, he was admitted to the Oakville Trafalgar psych unit where he was not, it wasn't an appropriate fit. And they was just there waiting until he ended up getting a bed at Baycrest. But the key for all of this is, is that when the doctor would say to me, uh, we're going to discharge him into your care from the hospital, there's nothing we can do. I would say, I'm sorry, but I'm fearful for my safety. And that means he becomes the responsibility of the hospital system. And there are so many folks who have to resort to that level of violence in order to get the help for their loved one that they need, that the quickest way to get somebody admitted into a specialty unit is by calling 911. 
are you or any of the kids able to see him right now? Yeah, I go, I go three times a week now. And um, through the last year, he has a great team that work with him. And he has gone from being what you saw to being lovely and, you know, very quiet and calm. He can't speak as well anymore. He's hunched over because the medications do take a toll on him. He's on very strong anti-hallucinogenic medication. He is on an antidepressant to help him as well, but he's mobile. And he recognizes when he sees me and he's no longer growling. He no longer, he recognizes his own picture, his own reflection. Um, but, you know, and he eats well, put on a little bit of weight. Uh, but he spends, if he's awake for 16 hours a day, he probably walks and paces for about 12 of them. Just walks around and around and around and keeping his time. In our last minute here, Lisa, I need to ask you whether the unfairness of the life that you two should have had but don't have, whether that ever overwhelms you? No. No, because uh, you have never known the depth of love that you get from having somebody who you're caring for appreciate you and and light up when you walk into a room. And I don't think of Bruce as a patient, I still think of him as my spouse, as my husband. I still love him, um, always will love him. And I love him as my partner. Am I frustrated that I can't talk to him about what's going on in politics? Absolutely. By the way, Steve, I knew that there was something wrong when he started telling me he thought he liked Justin Trudeau. And I would look at him and say, are you like, who are you? What is going on here? Um, but he, um, he, he, Listen, I make light of it only because I tear up a little bit when I talk about it. Uh, caregiving is the greatest gift. It is the greatest gift you can ever be given to be able to look after somebody that you love. But you also have to be safe and you have to make sure that you're giving them the best care that can possibly be given. If somebody else can give care that is better than yours, then you have to hand it off and you have to make sure that he's looked after. And that's that's where we are right now, waiting for a bed in a behavioral support unit at a long-term care facility and hoping that he can go back to having more visits from me and the rest of his family because I'm the only one that can see him now. Amen to that. Uh, Lisa Raitt, I can't thank you enough for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your experiences, which will no doubt resonate with so many people who are watching and listening to this. Godspeed to you and to Bruce and your whole family going forward. My, uh, thank you very much, Steve. I really appreciate it. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.